Okay, so next is Mark, and I kind of glossed over the quantitative genetic component of my thesis, but uh, obviously Mark's work was uh, essential to that. Uh, I don't know, is this, okay, great. Thanks, Rob. Uh, I'd just like to have it recorded that um, I didn't mention G matrices first. <laughs> uh, but now we're onto the subject, we might as well hear about them some more. I'm going to be talking about these nilly null genetic subspaces, which I'll define pretty soon, and how they could be uh, quite prevalent and quite important in the response to selection, particularly in small populations. I'd just like to start by acknowledging the fabulous collaborators that I have. Uh, these guys I've been working with for an awful long time now, Katrina and Emma. We've worked uh, for a very long time on multivariate responses and the genetic analysis of high dimensional traits. I've worked with Steve for many, many years and today you'll see some data on gene expression, the genetic analysis of gene expression, and that's data that comes from Steve's uh, PhD student, Scott Allen, and Steve himself. Statement of the obvious to kick things off. Evolutionary responses depend upon genetic variation. But this is perhaps not so obvious. And what I really want to get down to today is, do we really understand how much genetic variation is available to selection to create these responses? And the conclusion I'm going to make is that perhaps we don't understand very much at all about how much genetic variation is available. So uh, Russ's equation, the response to selection, the genetics in the G matrix, and selection sitting here in the vector of selection gradients. I'm not going to talk about this today because uh, it's really all about this guy here, the G matrix. And just to orientate you a little bit, here we have the genetic variance in trait 1, the genetic variance in trait 2, however many traits we have. The genetic covariance between two traits, if those genetic variances are both one, that's a correlation between minus one and one. We can all understand that. <coughs> For a long period of time, evolutionary biology concentrated on these genetic correlations and their sign, negative genetic correlations, were interpreted as constraints. That's true in some respect, but positive genetic correlations act in exactly the same way. So it's not really that useful unless you've only got two traits. But if you've got more than two traits, it's not really that useful to focus on these things. It's much more useful to focus on what I'm going to be calling the spectral distribution of these matrices, which is the distribution of eigenvalues. And we're going to see a number of examples of that. So, just to show you why the spectral distribution is important in the response to selection, what we're doing here is we're decomposing Russell's equation into its components. So here, in this term, we have selection, and we're orientating that vector of selection with respect to the first eigenvector of the matrix, G max. And G max has the largest eigenvalue. It has the largest amount of genetic variance. It has to because it's the first eigenvector. And so what we're doing here is we're asking how closely is beta compared to this vector and how big is that eigenvalue? If that eigenvalue is really big, it won't matter really how closely beta is associated with the eigenvector we're going to get a response from that component. So G max is going to contribute to the response because that eigenvalue is much, much larger, perhaps, than the other eigenvalues. Down here, for the last eigenvector, say, if beta falls exactly in this direction, we're still not going to get a very large response from that because this number here, the eigenvalue, perhaps, is going to be very, very small. And so this creates two things, one of which we've already heard about today uh, from Jennifer's talk. Sometimes we're going to see individual traits evolve in 
the opposite direction to what we expect. They're going to evolve in the opposite direction to their selection gradients. And overall, we're going to see the response to selection deviate from the direction that natural selection wants to take, and sometimes it's going to deviate dramatically. So it does take a little bit of practice to get used to the fact that evolution is not going to proceed in the direction that natural selection wants. And that's, if this number here tends to be large compared to the others, that's going to be true most of the time. So let's step through then uh, a little example here. And this example is a, a bit of a bastardization from Dickerson in 1955. So these ideas have been around for quite some time. Here I've constructed a little 3x3 three three gene matrix. I've made it easy. The three genetic variances are all the same. The value of one, so it's actually a correlation matrix. And we've got some negative genetic correlations sitting off to the off the off diagonal. Now, those negative genetic correlations, if you estimated them in any particular system, you'd be interpreting them as, oh, they're kind of moderate, they're halfway between zero and minus one, they're not perfect. So, do I have any evidence of constraints in this system? Here's the uh, plot of data from this matrix. You can see that the three traits have the same amount of variance, just represented by those lines there. But there's a direction in here that has a very small amount of variance. And in fact, this matrix is almost singular. So the last trait combination, the last eigenvector, has virtually no variance in it. You can't tell that by looking at that matrix. And that's the point. Even though the three traits have genetic variance, exactly the same genetic variance, we have a trait combination that has no variance. And that's, that's the concept that I'm trying to get across here. So when we, when we measure these matrices in um, experimental populations on standard quantitative traits, here's an example of 10 wing traits in Drosophila. Here's an example of cuticular hydrocarbons, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. Most of the genetic variance is squished up into about half the number of dimensions that you have in terms of the phenotype. So there's three, four, five trait combinations, orthogonal trait combinations, that don't have a lot of genetic variance in them. And that's what I'm talking about in terms of the spectral distribution. We've got some eigenvalues that are going to be very large, and we've got some that are going to be very small. There's been a lot more work obviously done in this area over the last few years and what we'll see later is that most of, them, most of the empirical estimates display this sort of behaviour. I got to, uh, got to worrying though about the fact that all of this fancy quantitative genetics is really only a bunch of correlations. And so what we wanted to do was to try and get manipulative evidence for the shape of that matrix. And as evolutionary biologists, really the only way we have available to us is a selection experiment. And so what I'm going to de describe now is a, a selection experiment on these traits, the eight cuticular hydrocarbons. These hydrocarbons have a lot of neat biology, which I'm not going to talk about today. They're, they're real traits. These animals use them for mate choice, they're involved in stress resistance, but none of that's relevant today. They're really just eight standard quantitative morphological traits. That's what I want you to think about. And what we're going to do is select along all eight genetic eigenvectors. And we're going to do that because what we want is to span the entire phenotypic space with our manipulation. We want to make sure that we determine what is the response to selection across that entire phenotype. And the only way to do that is to select along the eigenvectors or a set of vectors that are orthogonal. So what does that look like? Here's a trait index for, for one of those eigenvectors. Each of the original traits is going to have a loading. And if this one was Gmax, for example, we'd be selecting along the axis of most genetic variation. 
This is only three dimensions, obviously. I can't draw in eight dimensions. And so there are eight of these. And the design of the selection experiment, we've got three replicate populations for each index. Uh, we're going to select for six generations, 50% truncation selection, which is pretty typical for artificial selection. And we've got two control lines. So here we have a scree plot of the amount of genetic variation, so the eigenvalues, in our eight original traits in the base population, the eight eigenvectors. So this one's Gmax. Gmax has the most genetic variance in it. Here's G2, all the way down to the last one, G8. And so this is that typical spectral distribution that I'm talking about. Now down here, you'll notice that these Bayesian uncertainty intervals suggest that these estimates are significantly greater than zero. That's rubbish. These, these confidence intervals are forced away from the boundary, so they're of absolutely no use in distinguishing a genetic variance from zero. They're simply there to give you some idea about the spread for the estimate, and they become pretty meaningless down this end. Over here, we have the response of the three populations in each of the eight treatments. Now, just to orientate you, that's replicate number one, replicate number two, and replicate number three for the eight original traits. And that black box there represents the fact that that trait in that replicate <coughs> responded to selection in the direction opposite to its selection gradient. The selection response in the first five eigenvectors went smoothly. The solid lines here represent the fact that there was a significant response to selection, that, so that there was a significant realised heritability. But things down in the last three eigenvectors got pretty iffy. So the dotted lines here represent the fact that those populations didn't respond to selection. And so for the third last eigenvector, one population responded to selection, one population for the second, and two populations, this one doesn't look like it, but I can, it is, it did respond. Two populations responded for that last eigenvector. The other thing to note is that the frequency with which individual traits responded in the opposite direction became greater as you move down through those eigenvectors which is what you would expect because the genetic variance is getting so much smaller. So we're interested then in taking this information and, and asking how well did this thing predict this response. To do that, there's a little bit of machinery that was sitting out in the literature from the early 80s called the realised G matrix. And so what we're doing here is we're taking our observed evolutionary changes and our observed indices of selection that we've applied and we're going to back calculate the realised genetic variances and covariances. So this is just a way of shrinking all that information down into some numbers that are comparable to our base population estimates. So here's the same scree plot. And now what you see are the, the estimates of the realised variance from replicate 1, replicate 3 and replicate 2 for Gmax. And they fall roughly within those 95% confidence intervals. And as you go down, this puts the smile on the faces of quantitative genetics, it actually works. Quantitative genetics has predicted pretty well the realised genetic variances from that base population estimate. Where it starts to get a little bit off is right down the end here, and I'm guessing that's, that's a consequence of the fact that those base population estimates are being forced away from the boundary through the estimation procedure. So the estimation procedures that are commonly used to estimate genetic variance in the base population 
constrain that matrix to be positive semi-definite, which means that you can't have a negative eigenvalue. It's got to be positive. And that hard boundary tends to push the estimates away from zero. So, Russ, it works. But what about real populations and... I guess some of you are thinking real traits. What about life history traits? What about all those things that I'm interested in? I've been starting to think about this over the last couple of months and this paper that just recently appeared in Phil Trans has helped a lot because these authors have gone out and collated all the known estimates of G matrices in the literature. And so what I'm going to do here is take a subsample of their collation. So here are the 40 estimates of G matrices from any taxon on any set of traits where five traits were measured. I've chosen five for a particular reason, as you'll see in a minute. And once again, when we plot the eigenvalues of those matrices, we see the same pattern. So the eigenvalue of G max, it's a value of 3.2. These were actually correlation matrices. So 3.2 divided by 5, about 60% or more of the genetic variance is crammed into Gmax. And there are some trait combinations which have very little genetic variance in them once again. So this pattern looks like it's, it's fairly common. Because that looks so cool, I started to worry, because cool things normally turn into artefacts. How can we determine whether this pattern is actually a pattern that deviates significantly from some null model? And so, in other words, what is the null model for multivariate quantitative genetics? It turns out quite disturbingly that the null, mul the null model looks exactly like the data. And we'll step through this, in a, through this now. If you just take 10 traits and you draw them randomly from a distribution here with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, and you make sure that the traits aren't correlated, so the identity matrix is the covariance matrix, so they are only going to correlate through chance. And you do a little simulation, here I've just done a very simple genetic design, 50 lines with five individuals per line. The 10 traits are measured on those five individuals. You take that data, you estimate your among line G matrix as you would for any inbred line experiment. You plot the eigenvalues and this is what you get. Intuitively, you might have thought that those eigenvalues would be pretty much the same, that there would be some spherical aspect to that symmetrical matrix. But that's definitely not the case. And so we need to do something about this if we're going to interpret those patterns from those observed G matrices as uh, significant genetic covariance and, and evidence for pleiotropy. It turns out that in the mathematical physics literature they've known about this sort of thing for 50 years. And random matrix theory tells us that what we call the bulk and edge behaviour of eigenvalues, the bulk meaning what's that general shape to that scree plot, and the edge meaning what is the behaviour of that largest eigenvalue. And these things follow some surprisingly universal laws for any type of symmetrical matrix virtually. And so that gives us access to some pretty specific distributions that where we can construct some appropriate hypothesis tests. So here are those 200 leading eigenvalues, the largest eigenvalues from those matrices from the previous slide, and they're arrayed across the top of this graph. This distribution comes from the tracy Widom distribution, which describes the distribution of the lead eigenvalue from any symmetrical matrix with some caveats around the way that the uh, elements are drawn from particular distributions. 
And so we can use this distribution in exactly the same way as we might use the T distribution to make a T test. And so those 200 random eigenvalues sitting up here, seven of them significantly deviate from the 5% expectation on this distribution, which is roughly about right for random data. So now we have a tool where we can look at these matrices and ask, is that lead eigenvalue significantly larger than I would expect by chance without having access to any of the raw data? There's a, a little caveat down here. Most of, um, well, all, really, of random matrix theory deals with either sample covariance matrices or symmetrical matrices of, with certain properties. G matrices don't follow those properties. And so we don't have analytical expressions for getting this distribution scaled appropriately to specific experiments. And so what we need to do is use an approximation method which basically scales these observed distributions back on to the tracy widom distribution to make our test. It seems to perform pretty well though, as you'll see. So going back now to those 40 observed G matrices from the literature, there's three analytical steps here we're going to take. We're going to simulate the structure of, of those real matrices and as I said they're five dimensional correlation matrices. We're going to scale those leading eigenvalues to the tracy widom distribution and we're going to use these derived scaling parameters to adjust our observed 40 eigenvalues so that we can see how extreme they are. So this graph here does all that for us. There's the 40 observed eigenvalues and there are two distributions sitting here. The grey bars are 10,000 samples drawn from the theoretical distribution and the open bars sitting underneath are 10,000 simulated values which have been rescaled to fit the tracy widom distribution. And so you can see that the fit is really nice. So this empirical approach to scaling the distribution seems to perform pretty well. We can therefore rescale our observed values to make them sit on the graph and what we find is that 26 out of the 40 show significant deviation. So in most of the cases for these five dimensional matrices there's evidence for genetic covariance between the traits which means that a lot of that genetic variance is being squished up into Gmax. Here's a, another example of this sort of thing and this is from Steve and Scott's data. So the question here is, okay, so we, can, we all measure half a dozen traits or so or as many as we can and we can construct these matrices but what we would really want to know is what is the distribution of genetic variance across the entire phenome? Because that, that's the question that where we really want to get to. Gene expression provides one potential tool to do that. Thousands of traits, they're quantitative, they behave really well. Um, and so what we did was we did an experiment where we had 30 inbred lines which were drawn from a natural population of D. serrata and we measured gene expression in a genetic design. So it's the among line variance in gene expression that we're interested in here. In this particular data set, of the 11,604 expression traits, 8,750 had significant among trait genetic variants. So they had significant heritability at the 5% FDR level. So there's a massive amount of heritability sitting there, at least when you measure it with an inbred line experiment. What we're going to do here is take random draws of those five traits. So let's just take five traits at random and create a G matrix. And we're going to do that until all the traits are allocated to a set. So there are 1,756 G matrices estimated in this experiment. And what we're going to do then is exactly what we did before. We're going to, we're going to scale a Tracy Widom. We're going to ask how many of the G max estimates from those matrices are larger than you would expect at random. So once again, the grey bars draws from the Tracy-Widom distribution. Open bars, it's the check to make sure 
that the scaling parameters are working correctly. And then what you really can't see are the dark bars for the real estimated G, G maxes from those expression Gs because they're all sitting up here. So there's a couple down here, but 95% of them have leading eigenvalues that are larger than you would expect by chance. Now, what does that mean? That means that across the phenome, you can draw out sets of five random traits and chances are you're going to have genetic covariance between those traits. That's an awful lot of pleiotropy. Just pick any random traits and chances are they're going to be pleiotropically related. Why do we see so much pleiotropy then based on those random draws? That's a really tough question to get at um, and this is this is one way that we've tried to do that. So imagine that we're interested in estimating a G matrix that has dimension 8,750. We can't do that. There's no machinery available to do that. We could spend an enormous amount of time estimating the 38 million elements in some kind of pairwise manner and then manually allocate them to their spot in the matrix. We could do that, but that's going to take an awfully long time. So what we've been trying to do is, is come up with a way of completing this large G matrix from estimates of very few of its elements. And so what we've done here is we've taken those little five by five matrices and arranged them down the diagonal of this partial block matrix K, which has dimension 8750, and they're the only estimates we're going to estimate. So we only have to estimate 0.6% of the elements in big G. We get, we're then going to use this approximation method, which is based on a, well, essentially a geometric mean approach, which is given by this equation here, and we're going to estimate a G matrix which has all the elements filled, but it's going to be an approximation. And then we can have a look at the eigenstructure of what I'm calling big G to ask where is this pleiotropy coming from? And so to, just to give you a feel for what it looks like then, these are the trait loadings of the 8,750 8, traits onto the eigenvector of G max. So remember we have the eigenvector and we have a loading for each of the traits. And so here we're asking, what do those loadings look like? This is what the loadings would look like under a null model where there is no genetic covariance between the traits. And here is what they look like from observed G max with 8,750 elements. So we have a trait here where a large number, a very large number, of these expression traits are being influenced by the same genetic factor in the same direction. And this then supplies the mechanism by which when you subsample small sets of traits, you continually sample genetic covariance. I'd just like to add that this kind of thing then is consistent with the very old observation that we tend to see correlated responses in selection in just about anything that we measure. Put anything under artificial selection, measure a second trait, it's likely to have experienced a correlated response, even though the trait doesn't seem in any way associated with the trait that you placed under selection. So to draw a couple of very quick conclusions, I take from this that um, pleiotropy is widespread, both among functionally related so those traits like the wing traits and the CHC traits, those traits that we tend to traditionally measure, but also among randomly associated traits. And pleiotropy can exist among a very large number of traits, at least for gene expression. The spectral distribution, these nearly null genetic spaces, these, these trait combinations with very small genetic variances are likely then to be very common because if you have large eigenvalues for Gmax, you're going to have small eigenvalues for those last eigenvectors. 
Interestingly, we found no evidence for truly null genetic spaces. So trait combinations with no genetic variants that could not respond to selection. We were expecting to find those, we didn't. And finally, particularly I guess for this conference, selection responses in small populations then are likely to be heavily influenced by the spectral distribution. And I'd like just to highlight this model by uh, Richard and David, which really emphasised the fact that the distribution of genetic variants, if it was like this, in conjunction with demographic constraints, is going to heavily influence these evolutionary responses, i.e. you're not going to get a response some of the time, but you might get a response on other occasions. And we've heard from Jennifer once again about how some populations did respond, some didn't. Thank you very much. Thank you.